Before we start today's video, we want to bring you a word from our amazing sponsor, June's Journey. June's Journey is an incredibly fun and engaging free to download game where you search for hidden objects in colorful and beautifully crafted scenes. After playing the game, I'm not surprised that June's Journey has more than 30 million fans worldwide. June's Journey is set in the roaring 1920s and it has an enthralling detective story. It's your job to find objects that are hidden in some beautifully rendered settings. I loved playing this game. It was challenging enough to be engaging, but I also found it relaxing to play while I watched TV at the end of the day. Every time I finished a game, I kept saying to myself, okay, just one more game. Next thing I know, I've played the game over a dozen times, and I'm awake an hour later than usual. To be honest with you, as soon as I'm done making this ad, I'm going to go play a few games of June's Journey. June's Journey is free to download on Android and iOS, and it's also available on the desktop through Amazon and Facebook. You can download June's Journey from the description box below this video. If you do that, you'll be supporting Criminally Listed. So download June's Journey for free today. Number 3. Gavin Mondal Located in northwest Alberta, Canada is Valley View. The town has a population of less than a couple thousand people. In the summer of 1991, the Mondon family had a cottage just outside the town. 41-year-old Susan and 46-year-old Maurice Mondon got married five years earlier in July 1986. It was Susan's second marriage and Maurice's third. Susan had three children from her previous marriage, 15-year-old Gavin, 12-year-old Isley, and 10-year-old Janelle. The three children lived with Susan and Maurice. The birth father of the three children, Ian McLean, was abusive. He eventually lost visitation rights to his children. Maurice was a good stepfather to Susan's three children. Both Maurice and Susan were school teachers, and the family lived in St. Albert, Alberta. Gavin was a bright young man. He had an IQ of 133, which put him in the superior range. Gavin had several close friends, but he wasn't considered popular. He had a passion for science fiction books, and his nose was often in a book. Some people said that Gavin had temper, and once in a while, he would get violin. Maurice had three children from a previous marriage. Two of his children had lived with the family. They remembered one time Gavin chased them with a hockey stick, and another time he chased one of them with a knife. Gavin despised doing chores, like washing the dishes, and he didn't like going to church. On August 6, 1991, 41-year-old Susan, 46-year-old Maurice, 12-year-old Isley, and 10-year-old Janelle went out shopping. They returned to the cottage a few hours later. 15-year-old Gavin was waiting for them with a 22 caliber rifle. As soon as his stepfather stepped out of the car, Gavin shot him in the head. He then shot his mother. He walked towards the car and shot his stepfather again. He waited for his mother to look at him and then he delivered the kill shot. Gavin then shot his 12-year-old and 10-year-old sisters at point-blank range. In total, Gavin pumped 10 bullets into his family. He then tied his stepfather's dead body to the back of an ATV and dragged him into some tall grass that was about a mile from the scene of the shooting. Then Gavin went back to the body of his mother. Using a knife, he cut open his mother's dress and undergarments, exposing her body. But there were no signs of sexual assault. Gavin then drove the car with the bodies of his mother and sisters inside of it into a group of trees. After hiding the car, Gavin went inside the cottage. He watched some TV and he tried to eat. He thought about taking his own life several times. Gavin ended up staying on the property for over 24 hours. 
Then, in the early morning hours of August 8, 1991, Gavin loaded up some clothing, a cooler, two knives, a shotgun, and the murder weapon into the family's minivan. He also grabbed a mystery novel, A Graveyard for Lunatics, by Ray Bradbury. Gavin then got into the minivan and started driving. He was planning on heading home to St. Albert, which is about 200 miles from the cottage. But before long, an officer noticed him and thought he was driving erratically. He tried to pull him over, but Gavin wouldn't stop. Instead, he led the police on a high-speed chase. At times, he reached speeds of over 105 miles per hour. He was finally stopped after he ran over a set of spike strips that the police had laid down. Once Gavin was in custody, he confessed to killing his family. The police went to the family's cottage and found the four dead bodies. What no one understood was why Gavin killed his family. He said that he was annoyed by the attitude of the entire household. He also said that he felt like a slave because he had to do so many chores. But Gavin said he's not exactly sure if the anger over the chores was the motive. He talked to a reporter from the newspaper, the Edmonton Journal, and he said, It doesn't make sense. At the time, the reasons seem acceptable. Now, I can't even remember the reasons. While Gavin was awaiting trial, he was held in a youth detention center. Shortly after the murders, he became a born-again Christian and he was baptized. It was decided that even though Gavin was 15 at the time of the murders, he would be tried as an adult. In November 1993, about two years after the murders, Gavin pleaded guilty to four counts of second-degree murder. In March 1994, he was sentenced to the maximum life in prison with the possibility of parole after 10 years. In prison, Gavin changed his name to Gavin Ian McLean, which is his father's name. Since Gavin had already been incarcerated for two and a half years when he was sentenced, he was able to apply for parole for the first time in 2001 when he was 25. He applied for parole at the first opportunity and his parole was denied. The parole board thought he lacked remorse for what he did. In 2009, Gavin was granted permission to take temporary unescorted leaves from the minimum security prison where he was being held. But the parole board noted that he still showed a lack of remorse. He showed a lot of hostility towards his mother and he considered himself to be the victim. In 2010, Gavin's case was reviewed and he was considered to be in the low moderate range when it came to violent reoffending. In 2012, Gavin was granted day parole. He had also gotten a job doing remote IT support. His supervisor called him an ideal employee. Then in 2016, 25 years after the murder, 40-year-old Gavin Ian McLean was granted full parole. The parole board said that his view about the murders had changed over the years. He accepted that he had a loving mother who did not deserve to die. One concern that the authorities had was that Gavin had never had a romantic partner. So they thought that he might not be able to handle rejection from an intimate partner. As a result, he has to immediately report any romantic relationships to the authorities. The authorities have said that Gavin will probably be monitored for the rest of his life. It's been five years since Gavin Ian McLean received full parole and he has stayed out of the news since. At the time of this video, he is 45 years old and his whereabouts are unknown. Number 2. David Brom The Brom family lived in Cascade Township, Minnesota. 
It is a suburban, well-to-do area that is home to a few thousand people. In February 1998, it was home to the Brom family. 41-year-old Bernard and his 41-year-old wife, Paulette, had four children, 19-year-old Joseph, 16-year-old David, 14-year-old Diane, and 9-year-old Rick. In early 1988, Joseph wasn't living with the family. For 20 years, Bernard worked at IBM. In 1988, he was an advisory engineer who helped develop new computer products. The family was devoutly Catholic and Bernard and Paulette were strict parents. Many people thought that 16-year-old David Brom was a nice young man. He attended church every week. He babysat for neighbors and he would shovel neighbors' driveways. But David and his father butted heads over his musical taste. David liked hardcore punk bands like Suicidal Tendencies. David had recently dyed his hair black, shaved the sides of his head, and spiked up the remaining hair. On the night of February 8, 1988, David and his father got in a fight over a cassette that David had recently purchased. The next day, teachers at the Catholic prep school that David attended started hearing a disturbing rumor. David, who did not attend school that day, had apparently told several friends that he had killed his family. One of the teachers called the police and that afternoon, police officers went over to the family's home. When the police got into the family's home, they found a grisly crime scene. In a the hallway, they found the dead bodies of 41-year-old Paulette and 14-year-old Diane. In the master bedroom was the dead body of 41-year-old Bernard. In another bedroom, they found the dead body of 9-year-old Rick. They had been brutally hacked to death with a 28-inch axe that was found in the basement. Bernard had been struck 22 times, Paulette 17 times, Diane was whacked 9 times, and Rick suffered 8 axe blows. The police launched a massive search for David. The next morning, someone called the police because they saw David using a phone booth near a post office in Rochester, Minnesota. When the police arrested David in his possession, they found a wig and makeup. The police think that he was planning on using the wig and the makeup to disguise himself. After David was arrested, he confessed to the murders. It was decided that even though David was 16 at the time of the murders, he would be tried as an adult. David's trial began in late September 1989. David pleaded not guilty and not guilty by reason of insanity. In Minnesota, when the defendant pleads not guilty and not guilty by reason of insanity, it is a two-phase trial. The first phase is to determine if he is guilty or not guilty, and the second is to determine if he was sane when the crime was committed. Several of David's friends testified. They said he had been planning the murders for about six months. After the murders, David called a female friend and told her about it. She testified and she said that David initially attacked his parents in bed. He then went to his younger brother's room and killed him. When he got back to the hallway, he found his mother lying on the floor. Although David had attacked his mother in bed, he had not killed her, and she managed to get out of bed and made her way to the hallway. His sister was leaning over her, so he attacked both of them. The jury deliberated for less than five hours. On October 3rd, 1989, which was David Brahm's 18th birthday, he was found guilty of four counts of first-degree murder. The second phase of his trial started two days later. David's lawyer argued that David was mentally ill. He said that in 1987, David attempted suicide twice. 
He also said that David suffered from multiple personality disorder and he had three distinct personalities. The second phase of the trial lasted a week. Then, for 22 hours over three days, the jury deliberated. They found that David was sane at the time of the murders. Therefore, he was guilty of murdering his four family members. David was looking at four consecutive life sentences. At the time in Minnesota, someone serving a life sentence had to serve at least 17 and a half years before they could apply for parole. If David were to be sentenced to four consecutive life sentences, he would have to serve at least 70 years of prison. His lawyer argued that the sentences should run concurrently. Then he would have been eligible to apply for parole after 17 and a half years. On October 16, 1989, for the murders of his mother, father, and brother, David Brom was sentenced to three consecutive life sentences. For the murder of his sister, David was given a life sentence that would run concurrently with the three other life sentences. That means David will have to serve 52 and a half years of prison before he can apply for parole. He won't be able to apply for parole until 2041 when he'll be 70 years old. David Brom is currently serving a sentence at the Minnesota Correctional Facility Stillwater in Bayport, Minnesota. At the time of this video, he is 49 years old. Number 1. Eric Burrell Solias Pone is a commune in the south of France. It's about 10 miles from downtown Toulon. In September 1995, 16-year-old Eric Perel lived with his mother, Marie-Jean Pantarine, his stepfather, Yves Bichet, and his half-brother, 11-year-old Jean-Yves Bichet. Up until about the age of 13, Eric had lived with his biological father's parents. Shortly after moving in with his mother and stepfather, Eric started to have problems. He did not get along with his stepfather and his strictly religious mother. Eric attended a vocational school. His teachers did not notice anything unusual about him. None of them recommended that he should seek counseling. They expected Eric to graduate as an electrical mechanic. But Eric had a dark side to him. Eric mentioned to a few people that he hated his home life. He did not like taking out the garbage or doing the dishes. He had several photos of Adolf Hitler in his bedroom and he had Nazi literature. Eric never dated and he was pretty much a loner. He only had one friend, Alan Guimet. Unlike Eric, 17-year-old Alan was popular. He dated young women, and he played in a band. At around 7.30 on the morning of September 24, 1995, Eric rang the doorbell of Alan's home. Alan and his family lived in Couer, which is a village that is about four miles from Solies Pont. Alan's mother was surprised to see the young man on her doorstep since it was 7.30 a.m. on a Saturday. She got Alan out of bed, and then he and Eric went out to the garden. They had an intense conversation, and then Alan turned and started walking towards the house. Eric aimed the 22 caliber rifle he was carrying and shot his only friend in the head. Eric quickly left the family's home. An ambulance was called for, and Alan was rushed to the hospital. Tragically, 17-year-old Alan Guimet died on the way to the hospital. Eric started walking around the streets of Kiras. 48-year-old Jeanette Violette was opening a window, and Eric shot her. He then shot 77-year-old Denise Otto and her husband. Eric then encountered an elderly couple, and he shot the woman. 
Then two young brothers crossed his path. Eric shot them both. 59-year-old Rodolf in Corvala was in his home, and Eric shot him through an open window. Eric shot 65-year-old Andre Coletta as she was walking her dog. Mohammed Murad, age 41, was shot when he stepped outside of his apartment building. 81-year-old Mario Pagini was out that morning buying a newspaper. Eric shot him as well. 59-year-old Marius Boudon and 62-year-old Andre Toure were shot outside of a bank. Eric walked for a little bit and then he came across 15-year-old Pascal Mostachi. Eric shot the teenage boy. At some point, he came across 68-year-old Pierre Mariano and 68-year-old Jean Logiero and he shot them both. Unfortunately, it was hunting season in the area, so no one thought that the sound of gunshots was out of place. Also, no one was alarmed to see a young man with a rifle. Eric was calm throughout his rampage. He walked quickly, but he never ran. He did not shoot everyone he came across. He seemingly picked out people at random to die. Unfortunately, Eric was incredibly methodical in his rampage. He always aimed for the head, and he usually hit his mark. If he didn't, he walked up to the injured victim and delivered a kill shot at close range. Finally, about 30 minutes after the rampage began, the police found Eric and surrounded him. At the time, he was in front of a school under a cypress tree. Eric aimed the gun at his head, and he pulled the trigger. He died nearly instantly. Several of his victims were taken to the hospital, but for most, it was too late. Eric claimed the lives of 13 people, including his own. He also injured five other people. After the shooting, the police went to Eric's home, and they made a horrifying discovery. The night before the massacre, Eric was at home with his stepfather, Yves Bichet, and his half-brother, 11-year-old Jean-Yves Bichet. His mother was at church. The police surmise that Yves and his stepson got into an argument. Eric grabbed the rifle, which belonged to his stepfather, and then shot him four times. Afterward, he beat his body with a hammer. Eric then went into the living room where 11 year old Jean Yves was watching TV. Eric shot his half brother and also beat him with a hammer. He then hid the bodies and cleaned up the blood. When his mother, Jean Marie Parenti, walked in the door, Eric shot her to death. There are conflicting reports about what happened afterward. Some news accounts say that her body was beaten with a baseball bat while others say that her body was not beaten. Nevertheless, this brought Eric's total body count to 16, including himself. People in France were shocked by the mass shooting. Many people were looking for answers. Why would a 16-year-old boy kill his family, his best friend, and 12 random strangers? People have speculated but there are no definitive answers. Eric Burrell did not leave any form of communication behind to explain his actions, and since he's dead, he cannot explain why he committed these horrible acts. Thank you so much for watching today's video. Recently, we launched a podcast called Into the Killing. In each episode, we look at cold cases that were eventually solved. In this week's episode, we take a look at the convoluted murder case of Angie Dodge. You can find Into the Killing wherever you find great podcasts. Thank you again for watching.